What a wonderful event this is, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, thank all of you for taking the time to uh, come and all those viewing it online and, and elsewhere on replays and videos. It's certainly an honor for me to be here. Uh, I want to take just a moment to extend my heartfelt uh, gratitude for all the diligence, all the wonderful efforts behind the scenes and in front of the scenes uh, by Stephen Shore and his team of magical elves and gnomes and everybody putting this together. It's a, it's a tremendous event of enlightenment and I'm, I'm so encouraged to see this. So thank all of you for being part of it and thank all of you working with Stephen Shore for putting this together and orchestrating it. Wonderfully done. Typically, I, I spend an hour or so touching on uh, all the relevant aspects of the vital connection between food choice and sustainability of our environment. But for this event, I'm doing something a little bit different. Uh, Steve and I felt that we should be dividing this up into two, two parts, two distinctively different presentations. Even though I could spend all day, all week, likely all year, talking about <laughs> any one of these topics, uh, today we're going to be covering these specific areas of concern. Quite a bit, quite a bit to cover. And tomorrow morning, we're going to be covering all of these very important topics to round out this uh, food choice, sustainability, environment, nexus, or connection to complete the picture for everyone. So I hope you'll join me uh, tomorrow in one way or another as well. Knowing and doing. This is Earth, the, the planet we live on. Well, I mean, most of us live on this planet anyway. <laughs> it's been here for four and a half billion years, with life thriving on it for three billion years. Hominids, such as Australopithecus, came into the picture at around four million years ago, and our species, Homo sapiens, separated ourselves out from that group at around 100 to 200,000 years ago. Put into perspective, our planet and life on it's been here for quite some time four billion years before we were. Agriculture and civilization began about six to 10,000 years ago when we started domesticating animals and plants. And then industrialization took place with factories popping up everywhere in the mid-1800s and early 1900s. So with this extraordinarily long history of life balancing itself so very well in somewhat of a Gaia natural manner for so very long on our planet, we humans came along and began the path toward creating serious damage to our planet, to ourselves, to other species, in only the last 150 years. A snapshot of our planet today reveals this. We're running out of land and fresh water. Pollution and human-induced greenhouse gas emissions are threatening our, our atmosphere and waterways and negatively affecting our climate. Our oceans and sea life are being destroyed. We're losing habitat, ecosystems, and biodiversity with ma mass extinctions occurring at a rate that we haven't seen since the dinosaurs were lost. 65 million years ago. Nearly 900 million people in the world today are suffering from hunger. One half of our topsoil has been lost with certain regions becoming completely desertified. All this while we witness escalating rates of emerging and chronic disease regarding our own human health. There are some scientists who predict that time is running out for us. We may only have 50 to 75 years, maybe at best 100 years remaining. These are researchers. They're not doomsdayers. I call all this global depletion, the loss of our primary resources on Earth, as well as our own health. It's still sustainability. I just think we need to hear it from a different direction, and I think we need to hear the whole story through an unfiltered lens. For me, the story is changing, from one of needing to increase awareness to one of a, of a time bomb that's ticking away. These are just some of the many timelines we're going to be discussing today and tomorrow. For instance, phosphorus and nitrogen balance is irreversibly altered today. Oceanic warming will continue with rising seas for centuries from now, even if we stop all greenhouse gas emissions from all fossil fuel use today. 420 million acres of tropical rainforest will be destroyed by the year 2030 and mostly replaced by livestock and crops to feed them. Well, we have about five or six generally recognized categories of generations of, of humans living right now. The younger X, Y, and Z generations are over here at this end. The uh, millennials are in there somewhere. I often can't find the millennials because they're too busy texting on their phones and playing with photos. 
<laughs> all, all productive. Uh, and over at, the, over at the far end, we have the greatest generation. And they've uh, done so much for us, of course, but they're also the generation with their parents that unintentionally began the irreversible loss of our environment. So that leaves the two or three generations or a combination of generations in the middle. And, and we have a daunting task in front of us regarding this environment issue, don't we? To first realize that we're damaging our planet and uh, to what extent. I mean, that's the first big step. And then how to somehow fix it. <laughs> when I step back and look at this, I see a, a picture of tremendous responsibility, opportunity of profound historical magnitude. My generation and the generation of our three adult children, those two or three generations in the middle that are in somewhat of a leadership position today, are in a unique situation to save Earth as we know it, save life on it now and allow a livable future for those coming after us, or we could ignore things act like nothing's happening, or, hey, when we get around to it sometime, and allow it to continue on its current path to possibly be destroyed. What's really at stake here? The extinguishing of our species and thousands and thousands of other species. We can essentially make or break humanity. That could be at stake. And if you think that this is a wild overstatement, a gross exaggeration, or that this problem is entirely related to climate change, well, then that doubt that skepticism and lack of awareness and lack of action all become part of the problem. So certainly something needs to change. What is it that we're, we're doing to our environment? What needs to change? And importantly, how fast does this change need to take place? The answers to those questions are quite easy, I think. We need to stop those practices and habits that we administer every single day on a collective basis, globally, that create an unnecessary and proportionately large resource footprint, beginning with the largest footprint of all, food, what we eat, and our agricultural systems. It's a larger resource guzzler than anything else we do. It also happens to be the easiest to change. Well, OK, as compared to mandated global population control, uh, the culling of other humans to get us down to the three billion mark, as we were, say, in 1950. Yeah, let's see, uh, you need to go. And uh, uh, actually, the whole front row, uh, we don't need you anymore. Out you go. Well, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Or the immediate elimination of all fossil fuel use, which isn't going to happen anytime soon. And you know what? Even if it did, it really wouldn't address a number of aspects of global depletion. So how quickly do we need to change our habits, our footprint? I can tell you this. It is not a time for baby steps. It requires big person steps because it needs to be done right now. It needs to be done today. We're on very real timelines. So let's take a, a closer look at all this and, and see what it means. Many of the choices you make in life will have a profound impact on, on something else in the world, especially with things you consume, like food. It's one of the major disconnects we seem to have. What you do here might, of course, affect something over there or down the road a ways in terms of time. How to start looking outside the microcosm or the bubble that each of us tends to live in, and then perhaps how to encourage others to do the same. Well, a little bit about my journey. I became very concerned about what sustainability really does mean and began looking at food choices and agricultural systems quite some time ago. So, so I stopped eating processed foods and stopped eating animals when I was in graduate school about 42 years ago. And since then, I spent, <laughs> yeah, it seemed easy for me. Uh, thank you. And uh, since then, I've spent thousands upon thousands of hours researching farms, cultures, ideologies, the effect we have on our planet by way of uh, food production. I've been researching just so many factory farms and then realized I needed to re research other farms, such as grass-fed, fish farms, cage-free, large and small operations here in the United States and in many, many countries overseas, learning and, of course, always questioning. This year, I'm spending most of my time trying to align governments, academic institutions, think tanks, funding organizations, all those that are in a position to move the critical mass forward in a positive way quickly. It's, it's my goal to get everyone on the same page regarding this environment issue and to do it as fast as possible. Well, we're going to examine the word sustainable, as, as I usually do, pretty carefully today and tomorrow, because this word is constantly misused. It's frequently morphed into so many different meanings to suit so many different needs. For most people, it refers to our energy sector still, uh, how many 
uh, miles per gallon your gas can, can get, uh, how many energy efficient light bulbs you can switch out to save electricity or to waste, how, what, and when to recycle, maybe even to composting. Occasionally we hear about economic or social sustainability, but rarely, if ever, is food choice properly positioned in sustainability efforts, especially the raising and eating of animals, despite the enormous effect. It seems to be simply too challenging for everyone, culturally, socially, and yet this word sustainable is the most important word in our vocabulary that we need to define accurately. Well, think about it. If, if we get this word sustainable wrong as it applies to our own species, species well, the consequences aren't so good, are they? <laughs> indeed, a uh, little stark, but indeed, civilizations have vanished based on how they used or misused their environment. <laughs> As I mentioned, we humans have reached a critical and fragile point in our evolutionary journey as a species. Just in the past hundred years, a blink of an eye, really, we've reached the Anthropocene era, where we've acquired the power to negatively change our biosphere, the litho, hydro, and atmosphere. We're ruining the very environs that sustain us and all other life on Earth. Unfortunately, we, we haven't acquired the, the wisdom or the maturity to be able to manage this power in a, in, a, in a sensible or beneficial manner. In fact, five out of nine identified tipping points or planetary boundaries related to our life support systems on Earth, five out of nine have already been passed. And all nine boundaries are interconnected. As one collapses, the others will soon follow. A team of 28 internationally renowned scientists have identified and quantified these planetary boundaries, which are just very similar to what I'm talking about with global depletion um, in various categories. And within these boundaries, humanity can continue to develop and thrive for generations to come. However, crossing these boundaries will generate abrupt and irreversible ja damage to the environment and then create risks for continued human existence. So once again, five out of nine identified boundaries have already been crossed. And with the other four boundaries, we're exceeding their tolerance level levels. The boundaries that we've crossed are with climate change, biosphere loss of integrity and extinctions, land use and land system change, and altered biogeochemical flows such as phosphorus and nitrogen, and also ocean acidification. The story for me always seems to begin with these two numbers. There are 7.4 billion people living on our planet today with 240,000 added every single day, net. Control the growth of our population then is an issue, but it's not nearly the problem as the number on the right, what we're doing to the planet. The number on the right represents the fact that there are more than 70 billion animals living on our planet that we raise and eat for food each year, and it repeats itself year after year in growing numbers. And in fact, that's the problem. This, this 70 billion number is also quite impossible to pin down. And it's very much on the light side, because on any given day, you might find up to 1.7 trillion chickens, or two to three trillion fish in the world, sooner or later going off to slaughter that one year. Let's look at a graphic about global depletion. Certainly there are other industries that contribute to this picture, but none have the comprehensive impact as animal agriculture. Simply put, we're in overshoot mode, demanding more of our planet's resources than what it can supply. We've been in overshoot mode since 1973. Today it would take one and a half to two full Earths to sustain what we're currently taking from and doing to our planet. Here in the United States and in a few other countries overseas, it would require five full Earths to support our current lifestyle. It's serious enough on its own merit, but it's made much more so because of all the layers and layers of various influences that tend to bury the problem and bury its solutions. What's critical for everyone to understand is that this is not just an industrial or a factory farm issue, not, not at all. It's a raising animals to eat issue. And we're gonna see that as we go along today and tomorrow. So let's continue refining our thoughts on global warming or climate change. First, we need to remember that global warming is just one component of the much larger, more insidious problem of global depletion, the more total effect we have on our planet, and it's not all caused by the energy sector. Discussions regarding global warming and climate change have now taken front stage nearly, nearly everywhere. It must be remembered, though, that climate change will have the effects of exacerbation. It takes events and makes them worse. Global warming and climate change, for instance, will not be the initial cause of these categories of global depletion. 
We cause these things. Climate change will worsen them. The, this state of our climate report was released just, just a couple of, uh, weeks ago in early August, documenting the work of over 450 climate scientists. The report is gloomy at, at best. We're breaking a number of records, records we, we, we shouldn't be so proud of breaking, finding that last year was the warmest on record, as much of you, many of you know. Records uh, such as global uh, temperatures now reached a one degree centigrade rise above pre-industrial times, a new record. Concentration of greenhouse gas emissions in our atmosphere has reached have reached now 407 parts per million. That's a new record. Oceans have risen 70 millimeters. That's almost three inches since 1993. The seas are now rising over three millimeters per year, which isn't so good for island countries, which is already causing island countries and some portions of island countries to begin disappearing. Now, a couple of things about this one degree centigrade rise in Earth's temperature. First, that uh, is about the new target that we shouldn't exceed, is actually 1.5 degrees centigrade rise, not two degrees as many had once projected. So we're already two-thirds of the way there to a hostile, potentially unlivable, irreversible in our lifetime set of weather patterns. Oh, and, and the second thing about this is, is that the first half of this year, 2016, is even warmer than last year, on track to set another record. So, Rather than simply knowing about this global warming situation, I think it's time we do something about it. It's time we act, and we act right away, isn't it? These numbers have caused quite a bit of controversy over the years. Um, how could the meat everyone's eating cause more greenhouse gas emissions than what's caused by powering all the cars, trucks, planes, and trains that we drive and fly every day? It's hardly conceivable, but Instead of 18% as that original 2006 United Nations report stated, or even the most recent figure of 14.5%, a couple of researchers found that livestock could produce, I mean, it's possible, according to them, they could produce as much as 51% of all human-induced greenhouse gas emissions. Now, most scientific organizations are not on board with this figure yet, but it does bring up a number of questions, and there are a number of reasons for the differences between the numbers, low to high. Most important for me is the vast underreporting, the overcategorization, the use of inaccurate global warming potential for methane, which was, is actually four times higher than what the United Nations used, and potential bias amongst the authors of those United Nations report, reports who are well-known consultants for the livestock industry. <laughs> Um, these lower figures are also without factoring in all the greenhouse gases emitted because of our demand to eat fish, the fuel, refrigeration, processing, packaging, transportation, etc. And regardless of where the exact number resides, somewhere between 14.5% and 51% or higher, it really doesn't matter, does it? Because it's too much. It's cause for alarm and it's cause for immediate action. A perfect example of how this information is suppressed occurs every single year during our climate change conferences. Pretty high profile, held originally in Kyoto with its 1997 Kyoto Protocol. Last year it was held in Paris, this year it's going to be held in Morocco, where countries come together, and at least superficially, they're trying to solve this global warming problem. But none of this is being addressed. None of it. During last year's conference, organizers knew that time is running out, though. For, so agreements were made called intended, nationally determined <laughs> contributions, which sounds rather subjective, and they are. So by all estimates, these, these pledges are not going to be ambitious enough. Well, that's because the Kyoto Protocol runs out in just a couple years, in the year 2020. There's still no legally binding commitments, and climate scientists predict that warming will continue to reach a rise of nearly three degrees centigrade by the end of this century, two times higher than their goal, even with these in intended, nationally determined contributions. Well, every aspect of global depletion has a timeline. It's really not a, a question of uh, if we're going to run out of something, it's, it's when, at our current pace. One of the most critical timelines of all is that is of climate change. We only have a two-year window of time from now to um, drastically reduce greenhouse gas emissions or we're going to see irreversible warming of our planet with catastrophic effects. It's already happening today. And what exactly does drastically reduce mean? Well, uh, drastically reduce means that we have to cut human-induced greenhouse gas emissions by half of what they are today, half, in the next two years. How are we going to do that? And then we have to get to zero 
net emissions by the year 2050. And yet, global emissions are accelerating, <laughs> especially methane. And the largest single source of global methane is from raising livestock. I mean, look, we have enough greenhouse gas problems from natural causes to deal with in the next few years, such as managing what's being released from the tundra as the Arctic permafrost continues to thaw. Why not make things easier on ourselves and by doing something simple like cutting meat and dairy products from our diet, something we, we can easily do. It's certainly easier than going up and trying to tackle the tundra, isn't it? <laughs> and if you do the math, it's, it's conceivable that we could exceed our budget, what's allowed for atmospheric carbon by the year 2050. We can exceed our budget without the energy sector or fossil fuels even factored into the equation, simply due to raising livestock. To summarize in simplistic fashion the connection between food choice and climate change, we have this. Climate change is very real, it's worsening, and the situation's urgent. Greenhouse gas emissions that we produce, anthropogenic, significantly affect climate change. Raising animals for us to eat is one of the largest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. And lastly, any food movement away from factory farms, but including grass-fed or pastured animal systems, will not solve the problem. In fact, it's going to make matters worse. More land use changes, more deforestation, a higher feed conversion ratio, more water used, and more production of methane. 60 to 70 percent more methane is produced conservatively per one grass-fed cow as compared to grain-fed. Being concerned about methane emissions, as we all should be, President Obama and the EPA earlier this year issued a final ruling to limit methane emissions from the gas and oil industry with no mention about livestock. But methane emissions from the gas and oil industry, such as fracking specifically, has been decreasing in the United States since 1990. There's the graph. Whereas methane and nitrous oxide emissions from livestock have increased globally by more than 54 percent during that same time period since 1990. Going one step further, methane from livestock production in the United States is the only greenhouse gas from the only major industry that Congress has now created an exemption for. Yeah, that's right. As of this year, the EPA is forbidden from collecting greenhouse gas emission data from livestock producers in the United States. Animal agriculture, though, is responsible for 44 percent, nearly half of all global methane production more than any other industry. And despite all this, the general public is more concerned about gas and oil and fracking than confronting the meat and dairy items found on their plates. Well, how important, as an example, is, is food choice in climate change? Well, we're currently pumping in 54 gigatons of carbon equivalent greenhouse gases into the, our atmosphere each year. 54 gigatons. If we converted all global cropland that's currently growing crops to feed livestock, and at the same time converted all plat pasture land with grazing livestock, converted that to regenerative plant-based agroforestry type of systems, producing food for us to eat directly, we find ourselves at a net negative greenhouse gas scenario. Complete mitigation. All greenhouse gases currently being emitted by all sources today would be sequestered or could be sequestered into our soil. This is where optimism about climate change can be found. But the reality is, is that we just can't seem to get our leaders on track, despite the evidence. And again, climate change is just the first step. Then there's connecting that to food choice, and then connecting that to animal agriculture, and then finally, it's the connection to all other aspects of sustainability. It seems like a long way to go. So we have to get through this first step, though, which, which might seem challenging, especially with statements like this next one from one of our leaders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I really didn't want to talk about politics. Not, I'm, I'm not going to do it. All right, I have one more. <laughs> I have one more. Just another quote. I'm sorry, I'm not going to say much about it. I'm just going to put the quote up, but uh, I'm not really sure what this is supposed to mean. I don't know what this is supposed to mean, but I do know he's pointing at me, and I'm fired. <laughs> and uh, I, I really am not going to talk about politics. Um, okay, I have one more. <laughs> uh, 
I, I'm going to tell you who I'm voting for, and I'm just going to do it with a, a simple slide. It's not a Republican. It's not a Democrat. It's this guy. <laughs> he, he, knows what's he knows what's going on. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> uh, current studies show that on average, we waste 30% of all food produced in the world. So reducing this waste is certainly important in our battle against climate change and loss of natural resources, isn't it? However, we could reduce our food waste to zero and still be wasting massive amounts of resources and continuing on a path toward irreversible climate change if the food we are eating has anything to do with animal agriculture. Well, this is a summary of a few of the numbers we're discussing today associated with climate change, just to kind of keep it simple. Our, our target is to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees centigrade rise, but we're already at one, quickly moving to two. Carbon equivalent greenhouse gas emissions, the concentration in our atmosphere, is at a historic high for human existence, now over 400 parts per million, but the goal for livable conditions is to keep this number under 350. We're em emitting 500, or excuse me, we're emitting 54 gigatons of carbon equivalent greenhouse gases per year. We should be at zero, and livestock emit minimally 7.1 gigatons per year, and the number is expected to increase by between 50 and 200 percent in the next 30 years. And remember, our goal is to be zero. Per one unit of protein, beef produces 150 times more greenhouse gas emissions than beans, such as soy or lentils. So you say, well, let's just switch to chicken and pork. Well, they produce 20 to 25 times more greenhouse gas emissions as soy or lentils, and with their tremendous rate of growth and numbers being produced, chicken, pork, and fish in aquaculture settings are problematic at best. Given the predictions of nearly every climate scientist in the world, our business-as-usual approach to climate change isn't working, and we simply can't keep focusing on, on only gas and oil. Therefore, it's time for us to get outside the box, take the right action, and to do it now. So looking at solutions, prescriptions, this is what we have. The first approach is to reduce our dependence on fossil fuel, just like Al Gore and everyone else recommends. But renewable energy infrastructure, such as building solar and wind generators all over the world to reduce climate change, it's a good idea, but it's projected to take another at least one trillion dollars per year for the next 34 years to develop. Well, well, we don't have 34 years, and we don't really have much more than two years, and we really don't have 34 trillion dollars. So another solution to climate change would be we could stop eating animals today. It doesn't have to take 34 years. And instead of 34 trillion dollars, it costs you nothing. That's the prescription to mitigate, not adapt to, but to mitigate climate change. Interspersed throughout our discussions are a few themes. One theme is how information about this particular subject has been suppressed, even mismanaged. So much so that objectives of many important meetings, like the climate change conferences and other organizations, well, those objectives aren't being met. And that all begins with the words we use. How, how clear are they? Are they conveying reality? These are all food movements that superficially seem to make sense. Yeah, they make you feel as if you're going in the right direction because they're going away from factory farms. They're going away from processed foods. Hey, even better, they're going away from high fructose corn syrup. That's got to be a good thing, right? Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Do, do any of these words mean sustainable or healthy? Many would want you to think so. How, how about the word humane? Does humane equal sustainable? And, and if it does, which, which it doesn't, <laughs> who is it that tries to define humane for all of us? Incredibly, there is one person that the USDA and every humane certified organization in the world relies on for that definition of humane. One person. Does humane then even equal humane? And what does real food mean? I mean, I have issues with its precepts. Real food is a very large food movement today, especially on college campuses that I visit. It's defined by being local, fair, sustainable, and humane. All four of those things at once. Well, that sounds terrific. But this is terribly misleading. For instance, let me see. Let me give you an example of this. For instance, this is considered not real food. Now, it's a, it's a, it's a Vega bar. It's, it's not real food because it's not local. It's made in Vancouver. That's pretty far away. And worse, it's processed. It's all put together for you. But it does have sachi inchi seeds, fair traded, 
uh, four different types of organic plant protein. It's really put together quite beautifully well, but remember, it's not real food. It doesn't fit their definition. Whereas these other food items I'm about to show you are considered real food. Over 19,000 chickens are killed every minute. Every 60 seconds in our country, 19,000. I suppose that's pretty real. And if chicken, beef, pork, fish, or any animal product is considered real food, what about these? R real food too? <laughs> sure, why not? They come along with it. And hey, these are free. <laughs> you don't have to pay anything for those. So unlike the Vega bar, these poor things are considered real food because they're local. And the real food people think that they're sustainable, healthy, and humane. But they're not. They're none of those things, other than perhaps being local. Therefore, the real food movement is flawed because the definitions they're using are flawed. Similar to every other food movement on this list, just because something is local doesn't at all mean that it's healthy or sustainable or humane. It doesn't even mean that it should be eaten. The, the, the only thing that local means is that it's not very far from here. Buying local has little to do with sustainability then, other than from an economic standpoint. It's a solid idea to help nearby farmers. That, that's important. But in fact, transportation is only responsible for 4%. Just 4% of all the fossil fuels used and all the greenhouse gases emitted in the entire food production process. It's, it's much more relevant to view all of this by using a complete life cycle analysis. 2014 was designated the year of the family farmer, which, which is a good thing. But in terms of our health and the health of our environment, we must remember that it is the type of food that's being produced that matters most, not the size of the farm or the miles traveled. So by all means, support your local farmer markets, one of the 8,500 throughout the United States, and support your local cooperatives. But it has to be plant-based in order to make sense. And here's a new animal agriculture movement that's gaining momentum called Climate Smart. It's a nice thought, but given the global warming predicament that we're in, shouldn't we be growing and eating only plant-based foods, which would then make this food movement the climate smartest, wouldn't it? <laughs> I mean, we all want to be smart, but who wouldn't want to be the smartest? <laughs> the most recent food movement in the United States, Canada, and Europe that's gaining considerable traction is this one, to eat less meat. Let's see. So the, the logic in this food movement is to eat less meat is if you recognize that you're doing something that's wrong, hurtful, and unnecessary, hey, well, let's just continue doing that wrong, hurtful, unnecessary thing a few less times each day. Yeah, I, I guess I see the logic in that. Yeah, sure. Despite what the United Nations and other gold orga standard organizations are promoting, this sustainability issue will not be solved by advocating simply eating less meat. Because that approach is subjective. There's no metric. It's inconsistent with the magnitude and the urgency of the problem, and it perpetuates irresponsibility with every bite taken. Also, it mistakenly shifts the focus to seafood, because we all know uh, seafood's not really meat, right? <laughs> so why worry about it? We're going to talk quite a bit about seafood tomorrow, sea animals, sea life, and our oceans. Again, it all begins with the words we use. Are they conveying reality? This represents a, a food term that is constantly used improperly. It's, it's a protein, perhaps a rudimentary protein. It doesn't have all the secondary and tertiary characteristics. But when you're thinking about eating protein, I mean, actually, you should be thinking about everything else you're eating but, as well. But if you're thinking about eating protein, this is what you should be thinking about. As in, I need to get my protein today. Protein is not the, the little buddy looking over my shoulder. <laughs> That's my research assistant. He couldn't make the trip here, but still there. Uh, seems pretty obvious. It's a research assistant. And what about this couple's therapy session? <laughs> They're having difficulties because one of them is constantly being called protein. <laughs> and the other one's not. And it's not her name. And she makes it very clear that she doesn't like it. She doesn't like it one bit. They're calling me protein. Are you going to do something about this? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> uh, protein's also not the guy on the left here. And yet that's what people are calling protein, aren't they? The guy on the left with the overzealous smooch and the 
excessive amount of saliva that he always has? <laughs> He's a cow. He shouldn't be called protein. He shouldn't be called protein any more than the guy on the right. And, <laughs> and yet we do. In fact, his name is, is Plato. <laughs> That's very, very special. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. He, he'd, he'd appreciate that. One of the most pressing concerns that we have today regarding sustaining our life and future life on Earth is our supply of fresh water. From 1941 to 2011, the world's population tripled, but fresh water consumption quadrupled. Earlier this year, the World Economic Forum ranked freshwater crisis as the top global risk to industry and society over the next decade, not climate change, which was number two on their list. It was freshwater crisis, lack of availability. There's a growing gap between worldwide demand for water and what's really available. With so much demand, there's expected to be a 40% shortage in just the next 14 years. What you decide to eat has every single thing to do with this. Scientists are very concerned about water scarcity, but I think it's more a matter of water management, isn't it? Instead of focusing on technologies, we should be first looking at choices. Is this a good choice? How about this choice? Does that look good? Are any of these good choices? All global averages. Are these good choices as compared to, say, these choices? Same global averages, quite a, quite a difference, wouldn't you say? Hey, it requires 400 gallons of water just to slaughter one cow or one pig in the United States. 400 gallons. Although water on Earth remains constant, the consumptive form it happens to be in does not. Four out of five people now live within 30 miles of a water-damaged area, meaning soon to run out or polluted. There are nearly 300 transboundary river and waterways on Earth where multiple countries share vital run running water supply. As we see water shortages over the next 14 years, we will surely see droughts, famine, human sickness, and then we're going to see conflicts social unrest, mass migrations, and even wars. Indeed, those living downstream will be fiercely battling those living upstream for their water rights. Climate change will make these matters worse, but not cause them. Food choice and virtual water trading through food, especially with water-intensive animal products, will play a much larger role than energy or fossil fuel use. In many areas of the world, freshwater scarcity coexists with hunger and poverty. Afghanistan, Sudan, Saudi Arabia are raising livestock and crops to feed them while running their water supplies dry. 60% of Ethiopia's population suffers from hunger and thirst, and yet their dehydrated land is being used to support a growing herd of over 50 million cattle, the largest in Africa. Syria, as we all know, is desperately in need of a number of things, aren't they? They're in need of freshwater supplies for their thirst, thirsty 18 million humans. But at the same time, they're attempting to provide water for 47 million cattle, sheep, and goats. And so it is with Pakistan, Mongolia, Russia, China, India, nearly every country in the world struggling with an increasing human population, dwindling natural resources, and being strangled by their meat and dairy culture. So that has to include the country of California <laughs> and the Southwest <laughs> United States. Uh, regarding fresh water and despite the recent effects of El Nino, things aren't going so well in California, are they? But have they given thought to where most of the water supply is going? It's not to golf courses and most of it's not to lawn care. Between 60 and 70 percent of the total consumptive water usage in California goes to livestock and crops to feed them. You know, being concerned and showing graphs of precipitation levels won't solve California's problem. The government mandate of a 25% cut in water use this past year won't solve much either because California hasn't factored in the water footprint of what they're eating. As an example, California uses 900,000 acres of land to produce alfalfa. Anyone here from California? Why do you do that? <laughs> no. Why do you do that? <laughs> because each one of those 900,000 acres of alfalfa require one to two million gallons of water per year to irrigate, and they all get irrigated 
every one of those acres. And guess where all that alfalfa goes? It goes to livestock. 5% to horses, the rest to livestock. 75% go to dairy cows. And there are 1.8 million dairy cows just in California. This brings up the point of virtual water footprint, which is going to be more and more relevant in the future as freshwater supplies globally shrink. It's how much water is used to produce a certain good, and then it's, it's shipped somewhere else so that water is, is essentially lost or exported. Our virtual water footprint in this instance is where we're extracting massive amounts of water from ancient aquifers that took 50,000 or more years to develop. We're using that water to produce alfalfa or other feed crops that are then being exported to other countries. California alone is exporting 100 billion gallons of fresh water per year just to China via hay to help feed China's 17 million cattle. China is quickly closing in on, they're only in third place, China is quickly closing in on Japan and United Arab Emirates as the leading importers of our hay and therefore our fresh water. These countries are running out of land and they're also running out of fresh water. They know, they've learned, that it's not wise to use their precious drinking water to produce hay for cattle. So they might as well get it from the United States <laughs> because we don't know any better. We haven't got that figured out. In all, United States exports to other countries more than 80 trillion gallons of virtual water per year, which is two times more than being what's being exported by any other country in the world. The vast majority of this water, make no mistake, is tied up in livestock or in feed crops that are then shipped to livestock overseas. Using less water to brush our teeth, flush toilets or do laundry or less time in the shower will save two gallons of water per day for each act. That's important. However, eliminating meat and dairy from one's diet will save on average over a thousand gallons of water per person every day. If California stopped growing alfalfa, for livestock just for one year. Just stop growing alfalfa for one year. Stop using that water. The amount of water saved that one year would be enough to provide drinking water to the entire human population of the city of San Francisco. N not for one year, every year for the next 66 years. The average household in the United States uses 50,000 gallons of water in one year, according to the EPA. Indoor use, about the same outdoors. It's quite a bit of water, and it's what we're focused on in times of drought, how to reduce this. The, the average person in the United States, though, consumes about 200 pounds of meat in one year, divided between 46 pounds of pig, 58 pounds of cow, 102 pounds of chicken and turkey, in addition to the 248 eggs and 616 pounds of dairy products, which equates to 405 thousand gallons of water per person per year just to support that animal product diet. So now a more accurate view that the EPA should be broadcasting and we should all be aware of is that every household of three people in the United States, well they use over a million gallons of water each year. Not, not 50,000, 1.2 million gallons. And 96 percent of that outrageous water use is from their choice to eat animals. So whenever there's a drought or a water shortage anywhere in the United States, which there are and there will be, does our government or your community ever step up and declare a state of rationing or eliminating meat or dairy? Well, why not? Why shouldn't they? This year, one of the largest desalination plants in the world opened near San Diego. It cost $1 billion dollars and it provides drinking water for 10% of the human population of that area. There's about a two to one ratio of seawater, ocean water, coming in and then being desalinated and then going out to, for drinking water. The energy required to produce this water in this, in this manner each day is enough to support the needs of 30,000 homes. This, this approach to freshwater scarcity is very similar to Australia, what I've seen in Israel and Saudi Arabia and in other arid uh, coastal countries around the world, but the answer to our running out of a natural resource, such as fresh water, shouldn't begin by turning to another source of water and then tapping that out as well. It seems, logically, that the right way to approach our natural resources is to use them in the most efficient manner possible. Instead of desalination, for instance, San Diego should have considered 
spending $1 billion on educating their citizens and policymakers on the environmental benefits of eliminating meat and dairy and fish from their diets. Among all the other benefits, then they would have liberated between 50 and 90 percent more water each day, rather than the meager 10 percent gained by way of sucking water from our oceans. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yes, yeah, no question. We're going to be talking more about our oceans and also about policymaking tomorrow. We'll, we'll get a little bit more into this at that time. Uh, you know, this is no different than the plan to pipe water from Lake Michigan in the 1980s <laughs> to Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Texas, you know, in the Corn Belt, where it was discovered that the Ogallala Aquifer, another ancient aquifer with water that's over 50,000 years old, it was drying up from irrigating all the livestock and crops to feed them in the Corn Belt. Well, we're running out of water in the Corn Belt to feed livestock, so let's just build another pipeline to, to Michigan and then drain all the water out of the Great Lakes. <laughs> I mean, never once considered simply to stop eating animals. Problem solved. No pipe. <laughs> Recent satellite studies called GRACE, the acronym for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment, has shown that 40 percent of the largest aquifers on Earth, 40 percent are being overdrawn unsustainably and are becoming rapidly and irreversibly depleted in our lifetime. California's Central Valley Aquifer is one of those. It's, uh, and also the southern portion of the Ogallala we just talked about in the High Plains states. They're two of the most at-risk ancient aquifers in the world of being entirely depleted in the next few decades. Others in significant trouble can be found in India, the northern uh, plains of China, a couple of them in the middle uh, east. And while some of the problem can be blamed on rice and wheat, most of the ancient water depletion that's being used in these regions, is, it, most of it's going to livestock and crops to feed them. As an example, earlier this year, among other locations in the world, 2,000 water wells dried up in Tulare County, California. These wells didn't dry up because of climate change. No. Tulare happens to be the leading county in the United States for dairy production. That's where all the water went to produce cow's milk. It's also one of the most polluted counties in the country. Cow's milk is produced at a ratio of 1,000 gallons of water to produce one gallon of milk. Well water levels in the southern high plains states, such as Texas and Oklahoma that we just talked about, have dropped by more than 100 feet during the last few years. Nevertheless, that area is still being used to support some of the heaviest concentrations of beef cattle. In terms of raw numbers, livestock consume 34 trillion gallons of fresh water each year in the United States alone. 34 trillion gallons. I repeat myself once in a while because the numbers are astounding to me, even though I, I see these every single day. They use this much water by way of drinking water and water to grow crops to feed them. A number of scientists have questioned and vetted some of my numbers over the years, like, like this one. And I'm quite used to it, no problem. And these type of, of numbers are buried, very often, they're buried within other data, often have to be teased out of other research because nobody's looking for them. They have to be extrapolated and then verified. It's a bit, it's a bit tedious, and the results are incriminating for those industries involved. I mean, let's face it, information like this puts the meat and dairy industries on trial. What researcher wants to do that? Well, I don't mind. <laughs> I don't mind at all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so typically, I, I provide any arguing scientist, which there are a few, um, I provide any arguing scientist with all my data and all my computations, like what you see on the screen here, and then I say to them, uh, there you go, do the computations yourself, have at it. <laughs> and after they do, my hope, and many of them have, is that they stop eating animals too and then spread the word scientifically because they've all found out over the years that my numbers like these are actually on the conservative side. So the question remains, even though we experience periods of less precipitation, less water available, is this a drought that we're witnessing in California and the problem that we should be concerned about and across the rest of the United States and the Southwest and and also in the Middle East and other areas of the world? Or is it more of a problem of misuse of our freshwater resources that are available at any one particular point in time? Maybe that's the way we should start viewing this, this issue. So then these are the timelines for freshwater. And it's really not anything we can feel comfortable with. 
The NRDC predicts that one-third of all counties in the United States, that's over 1,100 counties spanning 14 states, will face water shortages by the year 2050, with more than 400 counties being at extremely high risk. While palm oil has front page notoriety, tropical rainforest loss due to livestock has occurred at a four times greater rate than that due to palm oil. In the last 25 years alone, 10 times more rainforest has been lost due to raising livestock than what's been lost due to palm oil. So, so be concerned about palm oil, certainly, but then be 10 times more concerned about livestock and animal agriculture. Tropical rainforests cover 5 million square miles, which is 8% of Earth's land surface, housing more than one half of the world's 10 million species of plants, animals, and insects, many more millions left undiscovered, likely. The Amazon rainforest alone produces more than 20% of the world's supply of oxygen. You're likely breathing some of it now. Sure, Indonesia is losing its rainforest to palm oil plantations. It's important to take note. But all the rest of the countries seen on this slide are losing most of their forest due to livestock. Satellite analysis show that tropical rainforests are being destroyed at a rate of over 20 million acres per year. 31,000 square miles. That's more than 5 billion trees per year that are cut down in our tropical rainforest. 50% of these lungs of our planet, 50% of Earth's tropical rainforests have already been cleared. Unfortunately for those living in a rainforest, this is what a, a few thousand to a million year old tropical rainforest now looks like because the world's food priorities are with eating livestock, not with being stewards of other living things as we should be. This is the sad result, the burning and bulldozing of rainforests. Soon grass, pasture, and cattle will follow this in. Usually erosion, desertification, and localized climate change as well. If you choose to eat livestock here in the United States or anywhere else in the world, you're, you're supporting this destruction by fueling the global demand for meat. Brazil announced two years ago that deforestation in their country hit a 24-year low, which sounded good. But, but what does that really mean? Because they still cut down 2,000 square miles of rainforest during that one-year period of time, just in Brazil. And tropical rainforest rates, deforestation rates, have increased since that time in Bolivia, Peru, Malaysia, and numerous other countries of the world, including they've increased in Brazil again. There are three distinct opportunities that tropical rainforests have that could help mitigate climate change, in addition to what we've just talked about, about conversion of land. First, we could eliminate deforestation and degradation. Just don't do it. Second, we could allow degraded forests to recover naturally. And we're going to look at a couple of these examples tomorrow. They're very exciting. In, in tropical rainforests as well as elsewhere in the world, how to allow these to recover naturally and what's happened. And third, we could reforest areas that have already been cleared. These efforts alone could sequester and also avoid greenhouse gas emissions up to five gigatons per year. That's about one half of the current total emissions from fossil fuels. It's, amazing, it's an amazingly simple approach to climate change that also fosters biodiversity and prevents further extinctions. Between 70 and 80 percent of all rainforest loss in the Amazon is due to raising cattle, with another 10 percent lost due to growing crops to feed them and other livestock. And remember, again, these livestock are grazing. It's, it's not a matter of factory farming. A, a, a quick word about soy. 90% uh, of the soy grown in the world, plus or minus a couple of percents, depending on who you're, who you're viewing, 90% of the soy grown in the world is fed to livestock. Only 7% is used for direct human consumption. The U.S. and Brazil are leading producers of soy. Since 2006, a soy moratorium has been in effect in the Amazon area, especially in the Cerrado region, where most of the deforestation of tropical rainforests has decreased substantially. The land soy occupies in the Amazon has risen, though, by 260 percent since 2006, but only 1 percent of that soy-occupied land is being grown on newly deforested rainforest. While that seems to be, on its surface, a success story for soy, it's not. Because all this soy that's grown there is grown and given to livestock. In China and Japan are countries that are buying up large patches 
uh, land elsewhere, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, to produce crops like soy to feed to their growing livestock operations. So while it may be superficially looking as if it's a success story there, it's not there, and it's also not in other areas of the world. By the year 2050, most rainforests will be gone. And the few patches that remain will have already been way past their tipping point. This, of course, means that all the millions of species that originally lived in these rainforests will be gone. Their indigenous tribes and medicine men, shaman, will be lost forever. Their once abundant water systems destroyed. And, of course, their oxygen, their oxygenation and climate regulatory mechanisms will be lost for the next few millions of years, which is how long it took these rainforests to develop. And we've wiped them out in less than 50 years. Many predict that we only have 60 years left before we run out of topsoil, because one half of all Earth's topsoil has already been lost just in the last 100 years. Most of the world's agricultural land suffers from severe erosion. We need topsoil to grow food. At the beginning of this erosion desertification equation, at the very beginning of it, is deforestation. And the majority of deforestation can be blamed squarely on animal agriculture. In fact, less than 2% of all crops grown worldwide are with organic methods for direct human consumption, less than 2%. Um, what's that you say? I usually hear somebody in the audience asking, why don't we just grow more topsoil, you know, in large test tubes, similar to how we're going to grow more meat in the future. <laughs> or hey, maybe we, <laughs> maybe we could just grow more soil with a new app on your smartphone. <laughs> we have technology to do that, don't we? Uh, we do. It's called nature, <laughs> and it requires between 200 and 500 years to grow just one inch of topsoil. Th there is a quicker way, and again, we'll look at that tomorrow. This is how much land is being used to raise livestock. 45% of the entire ice-free terrestrial landmass on Earth. So how accurate is this ridiculous 45% figure? Well, it was documented by the International Livestock Research Institute. <laughs> so, so most likely, this 45% figure was underestimated. If we factor in the 230 million acres of public lands used for grazing, livestock account for 97% of all the land used for agriculture in the United States. The reason animal agriculture creates so many sustainability problems is quite simple. It's terribly inefficient. <laughs> And it wastes resources, it wastes energy, and it wastes lives. You can produce 15 times more protein from plants as you can from any animal on any given area of land. Meat and dairy products require up to 100 times more water than plant-based foods, a fraction of the fossil fuel use. And remember, plants sequester greenhouse gases. They take greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere and sequester them into the soil rather than causing them. Let's look at an example out of many, many. Uh, of how inefficiently we're using our agricultural land in the United States. Let's just look at this a minute. We're using 94 million acres for corn. 46% of that corn is fed directly to livestock, but that number is a little bit uh, deceiving in a way because 43% of all corn grown is used for ethanol for fuel. So let's back that out. Actually, 82% of all the corn raised in our country that's not used for fuel is fed to livestock. Another 83 million acres are used for soybeans, of which 91% in the United States is fed to livestock. 56 million acres are planted in hay, of which 100% is fed to livestock. And if that weren't enough, another 864 million acres are used for grazing livestock, total, on both public and private lands in the United States. That's ridiculous. Now, just for comparison's sake, I picked out one of many, many examples of some other way to use this land. Just, let's just think about this for a minute. How can we use this land a little differently? Maybe we could grow vegetables, fruit, or nuts, or some ancient grain, such as amaranth, quinoa, kamut. So I, I just happened to pick out buckwheat. Just close my eyes and pick one out, and I picked buckwheat out as an example. Now, we're currently growing buckwheat on 34,000 acres in the United States. Well, what's that supposed to mean? Buckwheat's considered somewhat of an ancient grain, but it's actually a fruit seed, not a grain. And from a human health standpoint, buckwheat offers you complete protein, containing all eight essential amino acids and a very, a very high utilization rate, meaning your body uses about 74 to 75% of the protein in buckwheat. Buckwheat's low in fat, gluten-free, 
packed with powerful fiber, helps with insulin regulation, so it reduces the risk of diabetes and obesity and hypertension. It has a number of antioxidants, many of them waiting to be discovered, many anti-cancer agents, and buckwheat also has the highest level of a substance called rutin of any food. Rutin is a very powerful anti-inflammatory agent. As a crop, growing buckwheat requires minimal water, grows in almost any type of soil, it suppresses weeds as you're growing it, and it adds nutrients to the soil. It sometimes used as a cover crop. We use it in our farm. Uh, out of all the land in the United States used to produce food, out of all the land combined to produce food, only this much, what you see on the screen here, is devoted to growing uh, buckwheat. Oh, oh my goodness. You, that's tiny. Uh, you probably can't see that. Let me blow that up a little bit for you. Oh, there you go. Uh, point zero zero three percent. That's, that's three thousandths of a percent of all the land used to grow food in the United States is used for buckwheat. And most of that's handed over to livestock. Given, <laughs> given all the amazing human health benefits of buckwheat and all the soil rebuilding characteristics of this wonderful plant, what percent do you think this should be? Quite a bit more. And remember, this is just one of many examples of how we could use our soil and water more efficiently to produce healthier foods for us to eat directly. Getting back very quickly, just a quick example of the human health benefits, many studies have been accomplished and are, are now underway as well that are documenting the enormous amount of benefits that phytonutrients have and found only in plants, can't be found in animal products, and all the disease prevention and treatment characteristics of these compounds. You'll hear much more about this, I'm sure, from many other speakers here. Here are just a few of the many studies related to rutin to tie this back into buckwheat, which is only one of the many phytonutrients found in buckwheat. And I wonder how many studies like this we could find that document all the health benefits of eating meat. <laughs> not, ver not very many. And this is just one compound found in just one plant. There are many, many other examples that we know of and are yet to be discovered. This statistic needed to be updated. Livestock now produce 7 million pounds of urine and feces every 60 seconds in our country. 7 million pounds, which is 100 times more than what the entire human population produces, and none of this is treated. To be sure, world hunger has many layers of complexity. One of the larger reasons is tied to poverty. But another significant factor is the looming shadow of our current demand to eat livestock and fish, which is indirectly tied to poverty. In fact, eating these animals ultimately affects food prices, food availability, and policymaking, which then suppresses progress in developing countries. We're having difficulty with this right now with a couple of projects that we're working on in Mozambique and elsewhere. Last year, there was considered a record harvest grain in the world with over 3 billion tons produced. But nearly half of that was given to animals in the meat and dairy industries. Importantly to know, each year, 77% of all coarse grain produced in the world for food, 77% is consumed by livestock. We can't blame climate change, droughts, or flooding for the world's food security issues. Clearly, the, the difficulty is not, is not how or if we can produce enough food to feed the hungry or the growing global population, but rather where all the food we produce globally is going. Well, not too long ago, I was um, asked to speak to microfinance leaders uh, of many countries at their international annual conference in Istanbul. Among many other things, I explained that the correlation between animal-based food production systems, the correlation between that and world hunger, which is what they're trying to solve, can be found in generalized global factors as well as on a local basis within the countries where hunger and poverty rates are high. Global factors include manipulation and control of seed manufacturing and pricing, primarily for livestock seed and livestock feed crops by large companies such as Monsanto and DuPont. Global factors also include buying and selling of grain, including futures by ADM and Cargill. And global factors include uh, many factors through slaughterhouses and packaging by Cargill, Swift, Tyson, and JBS. These few but very large and powerful companies control over 65% of all the seed and grain, and they control over 80% of all the final animal products found in the world. It's a very monopolized production and economic system, manufacturing seeds at one end and spewing out meat at the other. 
Because of the global demand for meat, cultural, social, political, and economic influences remain strongly supportive of the continued dominance of these large companies and of the meat and dairy and fishing industries in general. This then drives how global resources are used, how money is spent, and how policies are determined. The demand for animal products, whether factory, whether factory farmed or not, in developed countries, then drives resource depletion in developing countries, as well as perpetuating hunger and, po hunger and poverty. That is the connection. If, so we need to stop this, and we can stop it by supporting, with our dollars, only organically grown, plant-based foods and those smallholder farmers who produce them. Solving world hunger, though, isn't as simple as giving them the grain that would normally go to livestock. That's always been an argument. Just, just give them some grain that, that we normally would give to livestock. Well, it's not that easy. The solution, particularly in developing countries that I've written about and advocated for over the years, requires a multi-dimensional approach to sustainability, established on many levels simultaneously with organic plant-based food systems at the nucleus. The model for success at reducing hunger in developing countries, I believe, should look like this. No livestock. This is the model where all world hunger funding should be spent if it's to be considered responsible financing. One group that's making this happen that we should all support is the Purpose Group International. They're doing wonderful things, and we need to get behind them. The Purpose Group International. We're losing other species on Earth at an unprecedented rate. Plants, animals, insects, the current view of most scientists is more related to the rate of extinction rather than the exact number because they simply can't keep up with all the extinctions. They were losing anywhere between 1,000 and 10,000 times the background rate, that which we've seen for the previous several thousands of years, which used to be about two to four species going extinct per year. Regardless of the metric, it's, it's massive and it's an embarrassing amount. So why all the extinctions? And what are we doing about it? Recognizing that there's a serious problem, and, and part of the Convention on Biological Diversity held in 2010, 200 nations adopted a 10-year plan to save other species by the year 2020. They, they weren't concerned about saving them in 2010. They wanted to wait until the year 2020. <laughs> These are just four of the 20 targets that were agreed upon, just four. A midterm report was issued last year because we were halfway there to the year 2020, and unfortunately, it stated that these 20 targets will not be met. Worse, it confirmed that loss of biodiversity is actually accelerating. And, and by the way, these are the recognized five drivers of biodiversity loss on the right. Um, do you see a common denominator? We, well, nearly all researchers agree that the leading cause of all five of these drivers combined is animal agriculture, livestock on land, and fishing in our oceans. So similar to climate change, our leaders can set goals and targets all they want, but these goals and targets will never be reached without eliminating animals from our diet. For instance, just, just one example, it, it's pretty easy to meet their goal of reducing overfishing. Just stop eating fish. Problem solved. <laughs> Done. Uh, I also know where they could get 45% more land to save. <laughs> the Living Planet Index shows that we lost more than half of all vertebrate animal species in the world since 1970. Half are gone. Well, it's no surprise that during that same 40-year period of time, global production of meat and dairy products quadrupled. What we're doing to other forms of life on Earth is unparalleled in the history of our planet, where one species, is causing the mass extinction of nearly all other species. It reminds me of this somewhat well-known and very appropriate comment that if all insects on Earth disappeared, within 50 years, all life on Earth would end. However, if all human beings disappeared from Earth, within 50 years, all forms of life would flourish. <laughs> Even Pope Francis weighed in on his concern that Earth is our home, and that the environment has rights, and that we humans are selfish in our disregard of Mother Earth. Now, whether you believe in God or not, uh, he's absolutely right. But thus far, Pope Francis hasn't made that critical connection to food choice and the destructive effects of animal agriculture, but he will. And at least for now, the seed has been planted. 
Today, there's really no organization or business in the United States and most of the rest of the world that expects to be taken seriously that does not have this word sustainable found somewhere in their corporate responsibility statement. I mean, look, even funeral products want to be sustainable. <laughs> so, so now it's up to us to guide everyone through that open door to make that final connection to food choice. The choices we make together, particularly with things we consume, such as food, dictates supply and therefore directs the use of our resources. It's not the industrial meat producer or the dairy factory farmer that will take down the last standing rainforest on Earth. And it won't be the, the large commercial fishing trawler that's responsible for catching that last poor single fish remaining in the sea. It'll be the human consumer who's demanding it. In summary of today, this half of the presentation, the part one, uh, it's not a time for baby steps or for us to, to simply do less of something that's extremely destructive. We need to begin thinking outside of self at our effect on others and future generations of all species and then to act now. The clock is ticking. If, if you haven't done so already, consider adopting a, a fully whole food plant-based diet today and then don't stop there. Please encourage others to do the same. We must all remember that it, thank you, we must remember that it is our planet Earth that sustains and nourishes us. So it really won't matter how healthy we are as individuals if our planet is not healthy. Tomorrow, beginning at 9 a.m., I'm going to be talking about so many more important topics critical to our survival as a species and the effect we have on our planet and other living beings. I'm not going to review all of them now, but these are the topics we're going to talk about. Our oceans, one quick thing about that, we're going to be talking about the real truth about sustainable seafood that you won't hear anywhere else. We're going to talk about remedies and timelines. We're also going to be talking about the future of food, grass-fed operations, permaculture, carbon far farming movements, urban agriculture. We're going to talk about this food choice sustainability gap. How bad is it? What's the current view of policymakers? We're going to look at some unique insights related to our current state of unsustainability, and we're going to be looking at perceived hurdles. I also have a few predictions for you, what's, what I think is going to take place over the next 10, 20, 30 years. So therefore, we have solutions that we're going to explore, viable remedies, including grassroots efforts and many things that we can accomplish together. We also have an ambassador program I'm going to introduce. And we, of course, have a summary of the optimism and hope, optimism and hope that is clearly there. So I hope, I hope you'll join me tomorrow. We're in a unique situation to help save Earth as we know it, help save life on it now and allow a livable future for those who inherit the Earth from us when we're gone, or we could allow it to continue on its current path to possibly be destroyed. We have enough information in front of us to make the right decisions. And in doing so, we will be seen not just as stewards, but as superheroes who stopped a runaway train with all of us on board and turned it in the direction of optimal sustainability, of rejuvenation, before we went over the cliff. I consider those of you in this room and those watching online and on future replays as our enlightened leaders. You can make this happen. You can inspire others to make this happen. I'd like to think it'll be our defining ethos, our legacy by which we will be remembered. How nice would that be? So I encourage all of us here today to go out and inspire others to become aware. Thank you so very much for sharing this past hour and a half with me. Uh, it's certainly a privilege for me to be here. Thank you so very much. Hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you.